Hello and welcome to News Night, where we speak to major players in Nigeria's journey to democracy and development. I am Ladi Akiri Dolwale. Thanks for being with us. My guest says it is quite challenging establishing a balance between national economic interests and the diplomacy required to keep neighbors happy. My guest also thinks the current administration's initial reluctance to join the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement was right because it was to ensure that its market was protected from the practice of dumping. Newsnight talks to the Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, Otumba Ni Adebayo. Honorable Minister, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, you're in charge of an area of government that is quite challenging, uh, industry, trade, and then investment. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Most places thrive because the measures by which they calculate how productive, uh, how industrious their people are, are quite high. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, in the case of Nigeria, what are your thoughts on our level of productivity and industry, shall we say? Well, uh, we have been encountering quite a few problems, and the latest problems really had been as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, uh, we, have, we have been taking various steps to overcome these problems. Uh, we had in place an industrial revolution plan, which was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, created in 2013 and expired in 2017. So uh, once on my assumption of office, that was the first thing that I approached. And uh, we are hopeful that we will have a new and updated um, industrial revolution plan. And that will give a direction that we want uh, our industry to go. We believe that uh, industry, as you're aware, Mr. President is very keen on uh, getting our unemployed youth employed. He had made a pledge of uh, taking 100 million people out of poverty over the next 10 years. And uh, we believe that uh, by um, increasing the industrial uh, uh, scope, that uh, it will be an opportunity. It will be one of the ways by which we can get our youth employed. So we're doing a lot in that regard to see to it that uh, we widen the scope of industry. We are doing a lot to assist current industrialists to expand and increase their production capacities. Uh, there are many problems, as I'm sure you're very well aware. One of the major problems being lack of adequate foreign exchange. That's a major problem for us at the moment. But uh, within the parameters of what is available, we are doing a lot to encourage and to assist uh, industries to uh, access foreign exchange with the support of the government of the central bank. Uh, he has come up with a policy whereby he's giving priority to people who are utilizing local raw materials. Uh, he will give you, if you're utilizing local raw materials for your industry, then you, you, you have priority of getting foreign exchange for your machinery. So there's a lot going on in that regard. Uh, we are working with all the foreign embassies, the foreign, uh, because they represent the, uh, the companies the, of their countries that are operating, yes. they're operating here in Nigeria. So we meet with them regularly, we listen to their problems, and we see how we can resolve these problems. Infrastructure would be one of the key things. And I, I say that knowing fully well that industry, uh, of course, keys into trade and, of course, keys into uh, investment. So uh, pardon me if the conversation, of course, goes yeah. between the yeah. three. Uh, now, infrastructure seems to be a challenge both in terms of the industry and then in terms of even trade and the possibilities of investment. Mm. Uh, before the interview, with, uh, when we were chatting, I talked about a number of other things which are not in direct control of as Minister of Industry, Trade mm. and Investment, but which tend to have impact. Mm. One of which is uh, the infrastructure I talked about. Take, for example, the issue of the ports. Mm. Uh, many people bring in things and want to take out things from Nigeria, mm. both in raw form and with value addition. Mm. But there are issues with that, um, which impacts on the ease of doing business here. Mm. What can you tell us in terms of what the ministry, in, probably in conjunction with others, has been doing in that regard? 
Well, uh, a lot actually. Uh, there's actually a committee under the chairmanship of the uh, vice president that's looking at the issue of uh, a one single window trade portal for uh, the port so that uh, we can have in place uh, a system whereby there will be a quick movement of goods from the port into the country and from the port for exports as well. So a lot is going on in that regard. Uh, furthermore, the federal government in response to that is also, has also awarded contracts for the importation of scanners, which will uh, improve and quicken the uh, clearance of goods from the port. So uh, government is not unaware of uh, the problems that exist. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, government has paid a lot of, uh, has made a lot of effort with regards to the bad roads leading to the port, especially to the upper port. Uh, the roads are being fixed at the moment. So a lot is going on in that regard. Uh, we, as the ministry, we, uh, we collaborate with all the other agencies of government that are responsible for, this, uh, for these infrastructure facilities. And uh, where we feel there are problems, we engage with them and with a view to see how to resolve these problems. You talked about the agencies. Uh, within the ambit of the Ministry of uh, Industry, Trade and Investment, mm -hmm. there are several agencies. And then outside of its ambit, mm -hmm. uh, there are others, uh, mm -hmm. the Export Promotion Council, the Investment Promotion mm -hmm. Council, mm -hmm. just to mention two mm -hmm. out of many. Uh, how do you marry the efforts that all these other people are doing, all these various agencies, so that everybody's not working in a silo, mm. and then at the end of the day, probably duplicating the efforts mm. of others? Because we've seen that in many instances. You have people doing roadshows, and then they meet other people doing... What's going on? Well, what we do in the ministry is every month we meet with all our agencies. So all the agencies meet with the ministry so that we everybody puts everything on the table. We have... Um, uh, they give us an update on what they're doing in their agencies. So the ministry is aware. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the agencies report to the ministry. So by the time we all sit together and have, we have, everybody has a clear picture of what is going on. So we're able to use that to put everything together so we work as one government as opposed to dissipating our energies in different, in different uh, directions. Taxation. Mm. Um, because, of course, everybody knows that all levels of government now are in dire need of money and revenue. They're looking for it. And one of the easiest ways is taxing uh, those who are within, you know, the official and sometimes the unofficial uh, uh, sectors. But your, your brief will be to not let that be a hindrance to people being able to do business. We've had cases where... Uh, individuals and organizations have been taxed to the point where they've had to withdraw. Some of them have had to close shop because there's no way they, they're going to pay uh, that. There are others who are big enough to fight back. But for your, from your perspective, this isn't helpful, is it? Well, what government has done, government is very, very uh, cognizant of the problems that exist. And uh, with regard to the MSMEs, government has made very many concessions to exempt them from certain uh, uh, taxes, especially with regards to turnover. I believe it's, uh, if your turnover is every year is about, I think, 20 million, there's a, there's a limit. Uh, I think you're exempted from uh, certain taxes. So there's a lot of government is doing in that regard. We, as a ministry, we uh, collaborate with the Ministry of Finance, which is basically uh, responsible for taxation. and. Uh, we, whenever they are looking at the issue of taxation, they sit down with us and we discuss. We have, we're able to uh, uh, put our own ideas uh, across. We let them know how we feel it will affect the uh, uh, corporate world, uh, the manufacturers and uh, all these MSMEs with a view to coming up with something that is reasonable such that we don't throw the baby away with the bathwater. In trying to raise money, we don't kill uh, people who are trying to uh, make a living. Smuggling. Yeah. Um, not too long ago. That's, uh, a, that's a major problem. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that has come up again. Mm. Um, and in very many surprising ways. Mm. The, the first question is, 
what are we doing about that? I know that was not too long ago. We closed the borders. It got that bad that the, the, the country had to close the borders, and we did that for more than a year. Uh, but then diplo diplomacy intervened, and uh, there were other considerations that meant we had to reopen. So where is the balance in this for a ministry like yours? Well, we are part of uh, the... Uh uh, a committee was set up on border drills, and my ministry is part of that committee. We were part of the decision to reopen the borders. Uh, we were part of the decision to close the borders in the first place. And uh, we, uh, we work hand in hand with other agencies of government, the Ministry of Finance, the Customs, with a view to seeing the areas where there are problems. We let them know where these problems are occurring so that those who are actively involved in curbing those problems can, can act. If that is so, uh, where then does, uh, uh, as, as I was trying to point out, the, there's the economic argument. Mm. But Nigeria is also the biggest member of ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when uh, you make this economic argument, others mm. say, well, you know, there's an ECOWAS protocol mm. that allows free movement of goods and services mm. and people you know, and that Nigeria is uh, one of the signatories to this, that mm. so we can really uh, shut people off, mm. even though we are the biggest market, so everybody's headed here. But that's why I asked the question, where's the balance between the strictly economic argument, which is our national interest, mm. and then, of course, the diplomacy? Well, first of all, like I've always said, you have to think of Nigeria's economy first. So we cannot allow a situation whereby we will bleed so that others can live. No, it's not, that, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to me personally. And that was why I was in support of the borders being closed when uh, the, we had a situation whereby the amount of rice that was being imported and being into Bene and being smuggled into Nigeria was uh, got to unimaginable uh, uh, proportions. So we have to think of our economy. Yes, we have, uh, we have rights and duties based on our uh, signatory, uh, being a signatory to the ECOWAS protocols and all that. However, within those protocols, there, have to, there are protections for individual economies as well. And we work within those protections that are guaranteed to us by uh, our membership of ECOWAS. And in that instance, because you travel a lot mm -hmm. in, in your role, uh, what is it that you get to hear from those who might want to come here, who might want to invest here, who might want to trade with Nigeria. What are, if I, if I were to say, three or four things that mm. you seem to see that they get mentioned? You were in South Africa. I mean, if I just mentioned the ones mm. you were in recently, you were sure. in South Africa, you were in Dubai, um, and uh, amongst others. Mm. What are you hearing from those who show interest here? What, what are their... Fears. Fears, and then what is it they are looking forward to in terms of prospects? No, first of all, the major fear is really is security. And then there's the issue of power. And then there's the issue of general infrastructure, really. I mean, you know, roads, uh, the delays at the ports and things like that. Uh, and we have been giving them, uh, we've been explaining to them the, um, uh, the, what the government is doing to solve these problems. With regards to power, we are aware that there's a power problem. So, however, based on that, what we're doing in our ministries, we are embarking on the creation of special economic zones, special industrial parks, which will have embedded power. We, they'll have all the infrastructure that is necessary. So all anybody who's come to set up a factory needs to do is just go into that industrial park. You have your power, you have your water, you have the roads, you know? So, you know, those are measures that we are taking. Another thing that we're doing is that many industries uh, are setting up their own power plants. And um, the government has uh, started spending a lot of money with regards to uh, setting up uh, pipelines, gas pipelines, you know, spreading gas pipelines all over the country. So you can easily tap into the gas pipeline, uh, access the gas and uh, power your plant for yourself. Now, what we're trying to do to help manufacturers, because of the, uh, we feel that the price that manufacturers are being charged for gas is rather too high. It's not making them competitive enough. We have engaged with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources with a view to seeing how we can have the price of gas reduced 
to make it uh, uh, readily available at a competitive price for manufacturers. So uh, these are some of the things that are being done with a view to seeing how we can make uh, uh, Nigeria an attractive business destination. Nigeria is an attractive business destination, one, because of its population. And two, uh, I will, you know, in my trips, I've been saying to people, uh, many African, my colleagues from Africa, uh, ministers of trade from many of the African countries, are not very happy with me when I say this. But I will say to uh, these uh, European industrialists and uh, for uh, uh, Asian and uh, 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 Arab uh, uh, investors, I will say to them, if you want to do business in Africa, you must start from Nigeria. Africa has a 1.3 billion market. Out of that 1.3 billion, over 200 million is in Nigeria. So your best bet is to start from Nigeria and then move out to the rest of Africa. If that, if that is the situation, that all of this, of course, ties into the ease of doing business. Uh, because if it's easy to do business, then everything, mm. you know, every, uh, mm. a lot of other things will fall in place. One of the things that seem not to make it easy for people to do business here uh, is inconsistency in policy. Mm -hmm. And I'll give an example. Um, there is the fluctuation in our foreign exchange mm -hmm. market. Uh, even as we speak now, that is an issue. Um, so I wonder, at the level of your ministry, mm -hmm. and, as, uh, and as someone whose task is to get these people to come, What's being done about that? Do you think? Well, we are in we are in talks with the government central bank, and uh, uh, as you are well aware, the major problem of foreign exchange is uh, our major source of foreign exchange today is uh, oil, right? Oil right now is fluctuating uh, because of COVID. Our production dropped. We're trying to ramp up that production so that we can. Uh, earn more revenue. But from the from our ministry side, what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage more exports from manuf or from manufactured goods. And a lot of effort is going on in that regard. Uh, uh, participation in the IATF, that's the uh, Intra-Africa Trade Fair in Durban in South Africa recently, uh, was a very, very good outing for Nigeria. Many of the people uh, who went, many of the MSMEs from Nigeria who participated in that trade fair, were, were lucky to get many orders. And there's a lot going on in terms of export from Nigeria now. There's a lot of uh, different uh, uh, products that are being exported. We're increasing the export of cocoa. Uh, hibiscus is something that is increasing in export levels. Shea butter, cow peas, uh, cassava. There's a lot that is going on in that regard. And now we want to go one step further. We are encouraging, we, we have developed the idea of setting up special agro-processing zones. We are in discussions with the African Development Bank uh, to get a facility to, uh, uh, in the first phase of the program, there are eight states involved where special agro-processing zones will be set up in those states. And these are special uh, uh, industrial parks, as it were, where all infrastructure will be put in place and all the uh, uh, industrialists need to do just come set up the industries and process the uh, agricultural produce before export. So what we're saying is rather than just export uh, the raw material, add value to it by processing it here before exporting. So that way, at least we have more people being in work. We have more industries springing up. So there's a, a and we believe that by the time we increase the level of exports of uh, non-oil uh, goods, that would help to in, in improve our, our foreign exchange situation. One of our biggest problems, of course, with all of this is what I would probably call masked trading. Uh, and, and I call it that because, of course, we've been talking a bit about COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, people take things from Nigeria. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. People take goods and services from Nigeria in order to evade tariffs and paying mm -hmm. the proper duties and so on. They take goods from Nigeria, they take it to a neighboring country and they export from there. The same thing when they're bringing them in, they take them into another country and bring here. Uh, first, as a government, what is it that can be done about that from our own angle? 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other governments, and then the issue of individuals. Well, what we're doing is we're trying to, it all goes back to the ease of doing business. So we're trying to create policies, we're trying to create a situation whereby it's easy for people to export their goods legally and get the requisite uh, returns on their exports. So uh, we're putting things in place, but we're trying to make it easy and quicker for you to export your goods through the port from Nigeria. And we're trying to get many people, see, you, you, we, there are many MSMEs that are not in the formal trading market who just work at the border area, just pass goods back and forth. We're trying to encourage them to come into the uh, formal trading area. As part of the economic sustainability plan, which government put together as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, 250,000 enterprises were allowed to register free of charge in the corporate affairs uh, re uh, re registry. So, uh, and that, the result of that is just to bring them into the formal sector so that people trade in a formal manner and in accordance with the laws of Nigeria. So we are doing a lot in that regard to assist them to do things properly so that all the, the attractiveness of smuggling will be removed. It will be more attractive for them to do things in a proper legal manner from Nigeria, knowing that they will get the requisite uh, profits on their... On I raised the one of the governments of those other countries because mm -hmm. Each time Nigeria seems to do something like you just described now, to bring people in, to formalize it, to make them legal and so on. Those are our neighbors in particular seem to wait. When we do that, they go further and then undercut us again, uh, either by bringing down their tariffs or by encouraging people to use their ports uh, under various guises and so on. And they say, this is free market. This is free exit, free entry, it's trade. But anytime Nigeria then tries to do free exit, free entry, and free trade, mm. everybody's crying foul because mm. they say, well, you're bigger than the rest of us. Mm. Now, where's, again, maybe is the, the question is, where again is the balance? And is there really a balance here? Mm. Or are we supposed to come down on them with the sledgehammer? No, I, I don't believe we should come down on them with the sledgehammer. I believe that we should use the comparative advantage that we have and utilize it for the benefit of our country. And that's my position. Because that also leads to what you mentioned earlier about security. Mm. The fact that many of these people are operating outside the ambits of the formal, trackable mm. uh, 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 processes, mm. a lot can get through, mm. including arms, yeah. which uh, mm. further exacerbate existing. Which is a major problem, actually. Exactly. And, uh, so, yeah. I, I, I raised, I, I mean, I bring that up also because the question then arises, at what point do you, I'm sorry I used the word sledgehammer the other side, but at, at what point do you will the big stick uh, on this? Because if you don't, it would appear as if this is likely to continue because this is an economic argument. It's only when they come after them that it becomes any other kind of argument. Now, with regard to the issue of security, I mean, federal government, as you're well aware, uh, right now has been lucky enough to get access to uh, arms and equipment that uh, we've been trying to get for quite a few years. And, uh, and uh, you notice that uh, the results are being achieved by the uh, security agencies. A lot, uh, they're beginning to uh, really make a major dent in the, uh, uh, in the ranks of the terrorists who have been um, uh, terrorizing this country. So I believe that uh, in the not too distant future, Nigeria would have overcome that uh, security aspect uh, that is a major problem now. And once that is sorted out, it will make it easier for the customs to be able to monitor uh, and track uh, uh, those who try to smuggle goods into the country. One other big problem that it appears as if industry has, mm. and those trading, especially mm. from our side, mm. is the issue of interest rates. Mm. Um, they're not able to access capital, I know there are banks that the federal government set up specifically to, but those banks pro probably just make a dent in the problem. The problem is much bigger than that. I'm wondering if there are other things. Well, this, uh, this is a, an issue that uh, came up and uh, um, 
in fact, we came up a lot of uh, ministerial retreats that we held. And um, the president addressed the issue and uh, because we asked that, uh, for instance, for the uh, Bank of Industry, which is a major development finance institution in Nigeria, we asked that federal government provide a de-risking facility, which is like an insurance facility for the bank to enable them to uh, relax their processes for giving out uh, facilities. The Bank of Industry gives out facilities at single in, at single digit interest rate, but uh, as of today, they require that you get a, uh, a guarantee from a commercial bank, which is a problem for many entrepreneurs, many of these MSMEs. But with a de-risking facility in place, right, that serves as an insurance cover for the uh, Bank of Industry, which enables them to relax the stringent measures that they presently have in place. Earlier on, I mentioned that you were recently in South Africa mm -hmm. and uh, your, the, the president's visit yeah. highlighted something that had already been on ground. The vi when the vice president visited uh, not too long ago and the, in, uh, in the years before COVID uh, came up, this matter was on, and which is that as a matter of policy, Countries, for example, like South Africa, mm. make deliberate attempts to mm. protect mm. their local industry mm. against competition mm. from outside. Mm. Uh, and that we don't, we in Nigeria, we're not doing the same. That's so you have, we, you, have, you have huge mm. uh, South African presence here, but you mm. have a very minuscule Nigerian presence in South Africa. That's mm. what the report says. Mm. Of course, you are in a better position to enlighten no, because I heard you say that's not true. No, that's not true. Uh, because look, we, we are the ones who are going out and looking for people to come and invest here. So we have to decide which one we want. Do we want them to invest or we don't want them to invest? We cannot go out, ask them to invest, and then they come and invest and we start to complain that they're investing. It doesn't make sense. So we are going out, we're asking them to come and invest because we believe that it's a good market for them. We believe they will make uh, money. And they come in, they look at the market, they look at it and say, right, yes, it is a good market. We will make money here. They come and invest. When they come, when they have problems, those, you know, I mean, uh, ShopRite, they couldn't cope with the Nigerian market, they sold off. But a Nigerian group bought it. And they are operating as a Nigerian company now. So, you know, uh, but when you say, they, uh, they have a level of protectionism within their countries. Yes, to a large extent, they probably do. But Nigerian companies are still operating in those countries. I know a few uh, Nigerian corporations that are uh, operating there. I, knew a few, I know of a few banks who provide services who have bought into South African banks and who are operating in South Africa. People look at markets and look to see what pays them. What is the size of the South African market compared to the Nigerian market? As, like I told you, Nigeria is over 200 million people. So it would be of more interest to a manufacturer or a provider of service to, work, to invest in Nigeria rather than South Africa. However, uh, I, since the advent of the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area uh, uh, Agreement that was signed by uh, 54 African countries, we have a situation whereby uh, uh, Nigeria has a, an advantage because of the rules that are being put in place. So it has given Nigeria an advantage to attract more investment into Nigeria than all these other, uh, than all the other uh, African countries. Like I said, the major uh, attraction is size of market. Size of market determines interest for investment. So we have that advantage, and we'll try to take advantage of that. We seem to have been fairly reluctant at the beginning to mm -hmm. sign on to the Africa continent of Africa. Yes, and that was because Mr. President, rightly so, felt that he needed to have uh, guarantees in place to protect Nigerian industry. He did not want to just sign something and not have guarantees that there will be protection for Nigerian industry. So what subsequently happened that now? Because happens? the guarantees are in place. Such as? Rules of origin. You cannot just manufacture, uh, sell things and say, this is manufactured in uh, my country. There are rules of origin to show that a certain percentage of the goods 
of the raw materials that are being used to manufacture those goods must come from those countries. Okay, so you cannot like order things from China, for instance, into your country, and then relabel it and say made in Africa. It won't work because we have the various customs to monitor all these things. So there is that protection in place. And in regards to that, Nigeria has a comparative advantage over many of these African countries because we are a large manufacturing country. Given that, uh, and what we had talked about earlier about what I call the masked trade, mm. uh, there were those, I'm, I'm talking about manufacturers now and industrialists, who had this same idea, which was that Nigeria was going to become the dumping ground. Mm. Uh, everybody, mm. this was a market, a sweet mm. market, uh, to mm. quote mm. the former Minister of Agriculture, mm. you know, because the numbers are there. Mm. Everybody, yeah. this was, so I'm wondering that if we have the Africa continental free trade agreement on one side, but mm. even at the level of ECOWAS, mm. we're already encountering this mm. problem. Would it not be a much larger problem to police uh, and to ensure, as you said, that the processes are followed and that mm. nobody ends up bringing things here yeah. that are not. Yeah, the beauty of it is that there are uh, sanctions when you do things that you're not supposed to do. So if things like that, we have sanctions in ECOWAS. It's just that we have been reluctant to apply these sanctions, okay? But it, if you get to a point whereby your economy is being fundamentally uh, undermined by, by your neighbor, you have no choice but to apply the sanctions. And the uh, African continental free trade area takes into consideration these regional uh, markets. They, they are recognized by the, uh, the main agreement for uh, the African CFTA. And all those considerations have been put into what is existing. Now, you, you, of course, before the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, you had regional blocks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, so, they, they are recognized by the, by the agreement. But I, I, don't, don't you see a situation where the regional blocks mm. are still going to be, shall we say, the main engines of this, particularly because of the issue of the currency? That, you see, eventually these regional blocks will, will be, uh, will... Uh, lose their relevance because all these issues, currency and all these things are things that are being looked at and, you know, over the, uh, because the whole idea is to have one currency for trading in Africa. So these are all things that, it will take time, it's not something that's going to happen in one year, two years. Even though, uh, like for instance, uh, we, trading was supposed to start officially 1st of January 2021. Trading has not started. Why? Because we have not been able to agree fully on the uh, rules of origin for all the goods. It has not been fully agreed. It is when we have fully agreed and reached those agreements that we can start, start trading officially. Now, individual countries prior to the Continental Free Trade Agreement mm -hmm had their own agreements. I know there were some uh, who were operating under the, I believe it's the European Union mm. Common uh, mm. CAP. Yeah. I, 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 it skips me now what the, the full meaning is, mm. but that, that's there. There were others who were operating under the preferential uh, trading mm. uh, rights with the United States and so. Now, when you then have this agreement, what's going to be the relationship between this and those. Which is why, which is why we, these are all issues that we still sit down to discuss. We are discussing all these issues. Uh, look, Africa is a big market, it's only 1.3 billion. The African CFT is the biggest uh, continental free trade area in the world, right? So it is to the uh, benefit of these other uh, countries to try to, to break it as it were. Because, you know, one large block like that is a major problem to uh, all these other countries. So obviously there will be attempts to try to approach us individually and things like that. But we are all sitting down together and we're discussing with a view to making sure that we stand together as one strong block and not allow anybody to break us. That will bring me, I, I will take you back to the issue of COVID because uh, 
COVID-19 was a disruption, mm. a major disruption. Indeed. It hasn't gone away, no. uh, and therefore it is still disrupting yeah. um, things. So people now talk, uh, are now talking about the pandemic economy. Mm. That is, we're living side by side with the mm. pandemic and going on with this. Mm. Do you think we here can or need to do that? Nigeria has been very, very lucky. We've been very, very lucky as a country with regards to the effect that the pandemic has had on us. Uh, when it first hit and Nigeria went into lockdown, uh, the first thing we did in this military was we set up an emergency operations center, uh, which we used because uh, there were roadblocks to check the movement of goods, movement of people uh, all over the country. So we set up an emergency operations center here and we're in touch with the various uh, industries. We gave certain uh, uh, industries approval to continue to operate because even though there was a lockdown, people had to eat, people had to drink, you know. And there were certain essential services that were needed. So we set up the center here. We were giving people approval. People applied to us for approvals to continue to work in their factories. And we were giving these approvals. And uh, not also, not only were we giving these approvals, we had a 24-hour hotline, because the emergency operations center worked 24-7. We worked for 24 hours, seven days a week. And uh, we had an, uh, the, uh, the emergency hotline, whereby if your truck is on the road and it's arrested or stopped at any checkpoint, all they needed to do was phone the, the emergency hotline. They would get in touch with the police authorities in charge of that particular area to enable you get clearance for your goods to move. So that we did not want the country to, because if we had a situation during that lockdown where people did not have access to food, drink, and all the essentials of life, there would have been mayhem. So we were able to avoid that kind of mayhem by setting up this emergency operations center. Like I said, Nigeria has been very lucky in terms of uh, how we have suffered from the pandemic. And, uh, our economy, even though it suffered, right? Government set up the economic sustainability uh, plan. And the whole idea of the plan was to reflate the economy, to put money into the economy so that, because we were just coming out of recession. Exactly. When, we were just coming out of recession when the uh, pandemic hit, right? So government needed to do something to, you know, to save the economy from going back into the recession. Yes, it went down a bit, but government, for instance, government came up with the uh, uh, COVID relief, uh, 75 billion dollar COVID relief fund, whereby uh, monies were given to uh, MSMEs to keep workers in at work because many uh, companies were going to close down as a result of the pandemic. But government assisted with payroll support. Uh, government had the, uh, uh, what do you call it, guaranteed uh, offtake of goods. They awarded contracts to MSMEs to supply goods to government, schools, and you know, food and all these things. So government really did a lot in reflating the economy. The government made 50 billion naira available uh, for exports for exporters to assist them to increase the level of their exports. And like I said, we're trying to increase the level of exports to uh, help the country generate more foreign exchange. So government spent a lot of money. They did a lot uh, as part of the economic sustainability plan. Uh, they came up with the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the power uh, thing with the solar, solar power yeah. uh, plan. Uh, they came up with the housing plan. So there was a lot that government did. And the whole idea of these things was to have people working with the uh, housing plan the number of people that will be, uh, uh, because by, set, by building more houses, there'll be more people put to work. There'll be more people who have access to housing. So there was a lot that government did, and that has helped a lot. It helped a lot. It helped the, uh, uh, the economy of the country a lot, so that uh, uh, the effect of the uh, COVID pandemic was not as, uh, did not hit us as badly as it uh, has done other countries. Given, given, given the, the, the pandemic uh, background and so on that you, there's a national development plan mm -hmm. now, 2021, 2025, mm -hmm. as part of a bigger plan, which mm -hmm. runs or is expected to run all the way until 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, 
first, your take on it? And secondly, how does your ministry fit in? I, be, I believe that it is uh, it's a plan that is good for the country, and I believe it is one that uh, uh, will make the economy of the country grow uh, better. But in terms of the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, mm -hmm. is there a specific role for the ministry within the plan? Well, Do you, you have know, measurable targets? Or what basically, basically, our role is very, very simple, very, very clear, right? Right. One of the things uh, that uh, what the major things that are our target are uh, the backward integration uh, program of, of government. Make Nigeria self sufficient in various goods, uh, which we're working towards. Make Nigeria self sufficient in the uh, manufacturing of sugar. Make Nigeria self sufficient in the manufacturing of tomato. Make Nigeria self sufficient in, in uh, cassava. Make Nigeria self sufficient in the field of uh, cotton, textiles, and garments. And such, uh, such areas. We are self sufficient in, uh, in cement now. We are encouraging the cement manufacturers to increase their productivity so that they can export more and enable us. You know, so we're looking at the areas where we have a comparative advantage, where, you know, to, to use those comparative advantages to export more so that we can uh, generate more foreign exchange for the country. Anybody listening to you with this would say that. They seem to have, they might have heard things like this before, mm -hmm. which brings up the issue of implementation yeah. uh, as being either the biggest enabler or the biggest product. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this one is going to be different? Because we are implementing. We are actually implementing. Because people for instance, for, for instance, people talk about automobiles, right? And when we came in, we noticed that there, was, uh, there wasn't a proper automobile policy in place. We have engaged with the Franklin Bank who have funded uh, our, our, our auto policy. Once it's ready, we take it to FEC. From FEC, it goes to the National Assembly, it's passed into law. All the original equipment manufacturers of motor vehicles, we've been talking to them. They are part of the process of putting together this auto policy. And once this auto policy is passed into law, that's all they're waiting for. Before they come and start uh, uh, setting up the auto assembly plants in Nigeria, once they start to set up the auto assembly plants, the component makers who work with them will start to set up because we've been in talks with them, we've been in discussions with them, we've made them part of the policy that we're putting together, because we don't put together a policy that will impact on people and then they do have a say in it. So we are sitting down with them. They are part of it. We have a consultant who is being paid, like I said, by the Africa Exim Bank. And further to that, Africa Exim Bank, at the last meeting of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretary in uh, Ghana, uh, came and made a presentation and they have set aside one billion dollars for the auto industry for Africa. So we intend to take advantage of that as well, so that people who want to set up their auto plants will have access to, to such funds. So it's all about implementation. It's all about the follow through. We are not sitting back. We're not just doing things. We are following through to make sure that these things are put in place. We want, at the end of this administration, to be able to say to the Nigerian people that this is what this administration has done in its eight years of being in office. Trade uh, consists mostly of vested interests. Mm. So a lot of the things you're saying, uh, there are some people who stand to win, yeah. but there are also people who stand to lose. Uh, I remember the memorable statement from uh, Chief Aldo mm. uh, when he talked about the issue of tomatoes mm. and uh, what has happened with it and other such products within uh, Nigeria's space. Mm. The vested interests uh, in some of the industries you've mentioned today, uh, automobile, those who import second-hand cars and, uh, and, and parts and so on, are not likely to lie down and watch you uh, put them out of business. Um, so are you preparing for that as well? Are you preparing for the fight back? Because they will fight back. The, the fight is already there, but it's not one that we're going to shy away from. We, we have the interest of the economy, the larger economy of Nigeria heart. So we're not going to allow uh, people who are a problem to, to stop us from doing what we need to do. Well, some, some of them are able to get back because it does appear that there are kinks in the system where there, 
where the possibility of corruption is introduced. Which is why we continue to fight them. Are you confident that this battle can be won? Can because we see I, evidence I, that I, sometimes I can assure you, it gets through. I can assure you that once we have our auto policy in place, there will be no business for uh, uh, importance of all these uh, scrub vehicles that they bring as a uh, as, uh, hand card. There, uh, many of them are 20, 30 years old. There will be no place for them. In fact, people won't even want to buy them if they have access to uh, uh, to normal cars that they can that they that they can afford. That because we're talking about auto industry, it mm -hmm. brings up the issue of the local industry. I mentioned it earlier when mm -hmm. we were talking about protecting them from foreign competition. Mm -hmm. But now, the issue is even that of helping them mm -hmm. to grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, for most industries, you get to a stage where you actually need a big shove mm -hmm. or a big push mm -hmm. uh, uh, to move to the next stage. It would appear as if sometimes the government appears not to be looking at them very closely. They struggle and struggle and struggle, and sometimes they go outside and then other people take them. Uh, the ones who are unable to take advantage of going outside who stay, give up the dream. Now, are, you, are you talking about individuals? Yeah, individuals, organizations, mm -hmm. you know, who are trying to do what you called earlier in the interview, value addition, mm -hmm. uh, uh, export, increased revenue, mm -hmm. and so on. They come up against so many uh, uh, hurdles. Obstacles, yeah. 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 We are aware of that, and that is why, like you rightly pointed out earlier, we have Pebec in place. The whole idea of Pebec is to make business easier to uh, to run within the country. We as a when you say Pepec, what's that? The presidential uh, um, the ease of doing business uh, okay. uh, committee. Okay. Right? So basically, uh, that committee, which is under the chairmanship of the vice president, vice president, right? Its rule is to look at all the areas where there are problems with doing business. You know, to to ease those problems out of the way, to make business easier to operate for people. Part of the uh, functions of this ministry is to see to it that those uh, uh, policies that are put in place to ease business are implemented. And we do our best in that regard. Major problems that people have with doing business in Nigeria is usually financial. And we are, like I pointed out earlier, we're trying to do our best, especially using the uh, uh, development finance institutions like the Bank of Industry, the Development Bank, Lexing Bank for Export, uh, uh, the Bank of Agriculture, which is going to, which is about to be revived. These are uh, development finance institutions that are in place to uh, to assist people to get the funds to be able to to operate and run their businesses successfully. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. It's been a very, very enjoyable session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's today's episode of the program. Thanks for watching. Would like to know what you think of the issues raised during this conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. Goodbye.